dead. Thanks for coming tonight on this uh, rainy day. Um, I know the weather is shit, but at the end of this talk, we'll have pizza. So hopefully that will make it better. Um, so yeah, as Marco pointed out, I, I wanted to give you some helpful um, accessibility tips that you can take on, on your work. Uh, but first of all, I, I just want to talk a little bit about accessibility. Uh, it might not be familiar uh, to all of you. Um, so accessibility are uh, often shortened to ALI or A11Y. Uh, I often say ALI because it's shorter. So accessibility is, is the ability of, of something to be, to be used by, by everyone, uh, even if, if this person has some disabilities. And this actually is, aligns very well with the web. Um, I think the web turns 25 uh, this year. Uh, but this was one of the, the fundamental aspects of the web since the, the early creations, um, according to, to the web creator. And when we think about these abilities, um, I mean, there's the obvious ones that, that we think of. Uh, either someone is blind or they, they cannot hear, uh, or maybe they have some mobility problems or they cannot move at all. Um, and also some cognitive disabilities. Uh, but we, if, we th if we think more, more broadly about this topic, uh, you might find that some disabilities are actually uh, temporary or situational. Uh, for example, aging. Uh, I mean, it is known that aging um, makes our abilities a little bit decreased, uh, such as sight. But also, if you just become a new parent, maybe you're using the phone with just one hand uh, while you're taking care of your newborn. Uh, or even if you're uh, outside on the street trying to use a, a website or an app and you have sun hitting your screen and then the, the contrast uh, gets affected by that, or you're in a meeting and you cannot see this video, you cannot hear the, the audio and it captions, um, or maybe you're a power, power user and just by preference, uh, you, you rather use a, a keyboard rather than a mouse. Or even you just had a, an arm injury and now your ability to use the web is diminished. So why should we care, um, all of us as like web creators, uh, about accessibility? I think there's uh, three uh, reasons for it. Uh, first of all, as I tried to, to, to tell you uh, before, uh, I think it affects way more people than I, at least I initially thought. Uh, so it is estimated or reported that uh, there's over 1.3 billion people uh, worldwide with disabilities, and the number will get bigger as the population grows older, um, but because as we've seen, aging uh, also affects our abilities. So it's something we should definitely care right now, but um, it will get worse and worse. Uh, so another way, it's, and, and this is a great way to convince clients, uh, is, is that it's on the way to become mandatory. Um, so it already is for most uh, of the Europe, at least for public websites, as of two or three months ago. Uh, and also, for example, in the US uh, or Norway, uh, and Australia and Canada. Uh, so there's countries where it's already mandatory by law. Um, but regardless, uh, it will always be more and more mandatory as laws are being uh, written. Um, so recently, I think it was a few months ago, uh, there, there was this European uh, Union directive, uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, directive that uh, tries to regulate these also for private companies. So I'm, at some point, and at some point here is three years, uh, all private websites will need to be uh, accessible, uh, otherwise they will have to pay uh, fines. Uh, and this already happens in our real world, it's not something new if you're building um, a building, uh, you have to have accessibility in mind, otherwise you're excluding people from using this building, uh, such as ramps or elevators. So it's, it's not a far-fetched idea to apply the same on the web. And the third reason I think it's the right thing to do. I mean, we are quite a privileged uh, crowd in that we get to work on what we like and people pay us really well, uh, but we also have this um, duty uh, to, to make the right thing and to to make the things that we do available for everyone, uh, regardless if they are privileged uh, or not as we are. So just to give you a context of like the state of things, uh, it's not very uplifting. Um, so there, there was this project published recently called the Web A Million, and that tried to analyze the top one million uh, websites, and it only analyzed the homepage um, of those websites uh, using automated uh, accessibility tools, which by the way, I'm, I'm talking uh, about them uh, further on. So before I, point, I, I tell you like, how many websites were good or bad, I just want to point this out that uh, only around 30% of uh, the all accessibility issues can be discovered automatically. Uh, so whatever number we find is 
there will be way more issues than the ones that we identified automatically. So here is the number all for the number of websites that are not good, and it's almost 98%. This was uh, really shocking, and everyone was uh, talking about it uh, in the accessibility community. Um, so it's really bad. And uh, I think one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this on a JavaScript meetup is that uh, they also broke down the results by like framework and language. And uh, this is an example for React, but honestly, all frameworks had on average way more errors than the websites that just use, use plain HTML. So I think what the numbers are telling me is that, that people that focus on JavaScript maybe don't know a lot about accessibility, which is okay. I mean, 98% of the people don't know anyway. Uh, but I just wanted to uh, share a few things about accessibility and give you uh, tips on how to change these numbers. Uh, because in, in practice, we are really preventing people from using our websites, uh, either if we know it or not. And I think we need to do uh, better. Uh, so again, I, I want to show you 10 hopefully actionable uh, tips that you can uh, take on your daily work. Some of them are easier than others. Um, don't get too overwhelmed. I mean, if you don't know anything, maybe start with the easier ones. Uh, but um, yeah, there's things that are easy to do and things that are a little bit more fuzzy and complex. So tip number one, landmarks. Uh, anyone knows what landmarks are? One hand, good. <laughs> so let's see how we, like, how we people are uh, able, for lack of a better word, uh, how we perceive a web page. So let's say we are in this uh, Wikipedia page and we know it's Wikipedia because we see the logo here, it's probably the first thing we see. Uh, we also see that it's a page about Porto. We see that the main content of the page is here. Uh, and there's some navigation on the side and on the top, and even a search bar. And there's way more stuff, but I mean, we get these in like one second. And people, let, let's, let's think in this case, a blind person. And uh, this is probably how a blind person will see it. Uh, so not very good. Except that um, people with disabilities, they also don't use the same tools that we do. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for people to use uh, browsers that they can see because maybe they cannot see. Um, so all browsers, they, they have this idea of accessibility tree, and it's similar to a DOM tree. And um, what you can do with that is uh, then use some uh, assistive technology software. Um, so for example, there's screen readers, but there's also, um, this is pretty weird, and I was fascinated when I discovered there's keyboards with Braille. So you put your mouse, and it's pretty weird. Um, yeah, but anyway, there's more tools than the ones we know. Uh, one of them, as I said, is a screen reader. And a screen reader is a, a software uh, that you can re use to, to, to navigate the web. And in essence, it, it just narrates uh, the web for you. So we, of course, you cannot see, uh, but you can navigate element by, by element, and it will read out loud uh, what this current element is. And better than me uh, trying to explain you what it is, I have this video here of uh, Leonie Watson. So she's one of the big names in accessibility. And she works for Firefox, uh, Mozilla, uh, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. And this is an example of her, uh, of, of Leonie trying to use this website. Just uh, spoiler alert, Leonie is also blind. So while we are seeing what she's looking at, uh, she isn't seeing this. We move from one list on the page to the next. So here, we move to the list in the banner area of the Domenza homepage. Let's go to the library. Next, we move to a list that contains all the navigation links for the website. Let's go to the library. Although it's a very convenient way of moving around the page, it doesn't really provide much information about the purpose of content when you reach it. ARIA landmark goals really help to bridge this gap. JAWS uses the semicolon on the key to move from one landmark on a page to the next. As each landmark area is reached, JAWS announces the purpose of the content it contains. So we can move from the banner area of the page and the landmark. to the search area search landmark. to the navigation area navigation landmark. to the main content area of the page main landmark. and finally to the footer content info landmark. ARIA landmark roles are really simple to get. Yeah, so this, this screenshot here is a screenshot of a voiceover. So it's a screen reader that is available on, on OXX, um, on all uh, Macintosh computers. And in this screen reader, there's a shortcut where you can list all the landmarks uh, they are on the page. 
So in this example, it's a screenshot of uh, Wikipedia, and we, you can see all these landmarks that exist. So there's a main, there's a portals navigation, a search at the bottom, a, ban a banner. Um, and maybe you are recognizing these names um, if you're into HTML5, which you pro probably. Uh, so main, there's like a tag, an HTML5 tag like that. There's, a, well, not navigation, but nav, uh, so close enough. And actually, they are quite similar. Um, so on the left side, you have HTML5 tags, and on the right side, you have the roles, like the landmarks. And uh, there's usually a connection between both, uh, in that, for example, if you use a main, then this is automatically inferred as being the main uh, landmark. And for example, here you see the nav uh, is automatically inferred as the navigation. Uh, so the, I would say that using HTML5 uh, landmarks is a good way to start. Um, and for example, we also see that the search, there's no search tag in HTML, uh, but you can always override it when necessary. And by override it, you can just pass this role attribute. Uh, you can do this on any element, and it will uh, change the, the, the landmark of that role. Good, that's all for tip one uh, landmarks. Good, so let's, uh, I want to try to give like real examples of uh, patterns you might see. Um, so in this example, we have, um, Let's say we see this on a website. We see, we see our documentation, click here. Or interested in our roadmap, read it here. And of course, we are seeing it, and we see, OK, there's a link uh, saying click here, and it's next to our documentation. So I can only assume that this goes to the doc documentation page, I'm guessing. Um, but for screen reader users, um, they can also just navigate to links on a page. And when they do, this is what they get, right? Like, they, they get, yeah, this is all the links that are available on the website. You want to click here, or here, or click. Like it's not really meaningful for them. Um, so this is an example, like a bad way to do this. Um, and the, I think the best, uh, one of the easiest options that's probably the first you should go to is to just change the copy. And I know this is not like a developer concern or any way, but from experience, what I've seen is that developers are the ones who advocate for accessibility at their company. So whatever is writing the, the content at your company, just try to... Uh, talk to them and explain uh, why they shouldn't have things like this. So a better way is to just uh, wrap the link in the documentation, and then it's pretty clear that the link goes to the documentation. But sometimes this is not feasible at all. This is a screenshot I took yesterday from the uh, Better Metrics uh, website. In one of the parts, I, I, there was the, like this list of features, I'm guessing, and then there's this link, learn more, these buttons. Oh, weird. These are buttons, but you cannot really see there. So one way you can do that is, let's say you have something like this, read more, and there's no other text that you can use to make this link meaningful. Uh, so one thing you can do is use this aria label attribute. So aria, it, this is something, um, so there's this called aria attributes, like aria label, and they are part of a spec um, which is called way aria, and the, the goal is to extend HTML elements to provide more meaningful uh, content to screen readers. So this is something only for screen readers, right? So in here we are saying, okay, this link visually has the text that's read more, and if we are looking at it, we understand where it's going, uh, but for a screen reader user, we want to provide more information. So we just say add a label, and then we provide an alternative. Good, uh, so now let's talk about uh, the third tip, which is uh, the dec decorative images. And the, the example I want to tell um, is, for example, this. I, I think this is fairly common on the web to see a link and together, like next to it, seeing a, an arrow. But the arrow doesn't, it's, I mean, it's not content. It's not an image that you want screen readers to say, like write arrow, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, so it's, I would say it's like a presentational image, like there's no content. Um, so this is, for example, something you might code it like this, right? Like having an inline SVG there. Um, to hide these presentational-only images, it only works for people who are looking at it. Uh, like, you can use another ARIA attribute called ARIA hidden, and you can set it to true. Uh, the default is false. Uh, you can set it to true. And this way, is like the SVG is not even there for screen reader users. Like, it will completely skip it, which is probably what you want in here. Um, but maybe you don't have an SVG, you have an, a, an image. You have an image tag with a source. And by default, uh, when a screen reader sees an image tag, it will try to read the alt attribute. Um, but this image doesn't have any alt attribute, so th the fallback here is that the screen reader will 
literally spell <laughs> like letter by letter the source. Uh, in this case, it will be very painful. Uh, so one way we can do this is by provide, providing an alt, uh, an empty alt attribute. This is to totally valid, and it's our way to signal that this image is only presentational. Uh, an alternative to that is to use role presentation. So it, this is the same, uh, whatever you prefer. I, I think some screen readers don't support the role presentation as well, uh, but I think this probably has changed. Good. So let's talk about uh, tip number four which is about icon buttons. So buttons like these, you probably know, like if you open a model, you have an X, and you see this like cross, and you know, okay, probably will close something, or a Twitter um, link probably goes to the Twitter of this company, or a trash bin probably deletes something that is next to it, um, or the help button. Like we can, like because we can see the icons, we know what they do, probably. Um, so let's say the button is like that. Like we have a button inside an SVG, I mean, we have to provide first, as I said, we, let's, let's just hide the, 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 the logo from assistive technology altogether. Uh, so hide it and true. And finally, let's just use again, audio label with the action that the button does. One mistake that I see people using here is to write audio label close button. Uh, the button part is redundant. Like when screen readers are announcing the button, they, all already, they will already say whatever the text is plus button. So if you write close button, the screen reader will say, uh, close button button. Um, so just a, a small thing. It wouldn't be the end of the world, but it's just nice to know. Good. So now let's try to build up on this icon uh, button example. And now this time, let's have a button which can have states. Uh, for example, like a mute button. Let's say you have Spotify and you have a button that can be on and, and off. Uh, there's no way in HTML to do this. But there's a way to do it with ARIA. Uh, I mean, visually, what you can do is probably like change the SVG or maybe adding a class and make the style of the button look like it's on or off. Uh, but again, people who don't see, they, don't, they cannot see this. So you have to provide uh, an alternative. So one way would be, again, to extend on this example of a button icon with ARIA hidden on the SVG, ARIA label on the button itself. And then you have a third one, a third ARIA attribute called ARIA pressed. And this is just an ARIA attribute that signals uh, like true-false state. And by, defaults, uh, by default, this button is not pressed. Um, so here, the sound is playing. And if you click on it, uh, like the other states should be like that, the HTML. So true, false. Uh, notice th that like, there's nothing that automatically changes the state. Like Just because you clicked on it, nothing will change this true to false, and vice versa. Um, so for example, if you're using React, uh, you still need to update this. I mean, you probably have the state somewhere. Uh, but you do need to update this property yourself. Uh, for React users, by the way, while usually React props are camel case, I think, or Pascal case, is that it? Yeah, anyway, but uh, ARIA attributes are still like dashed. Uh, I forget the names of this. Uh, but you get what I'm saying. It's like ARIA dash label all in lowercase instead of ARIA and uppercase L without the dash. Um, so it's the same as HTML. Uh, and in this case, it will like React. If you pass a boolean as a prop, it will just update it to true or false, uh, which is cool. Like that. Good. So we are halfway through this. I can see the pizzas. So I'm rushing. <laughs> Good. The examples are getting more complex, though. Good. Let's talk about form validation. And what I mean by form validation is, for example, you have this email input, and uh, the user just typed an email that is not valid. Um, so you signal this error and say, yeah, you didn't enter a valid email address, and also mark it as red. So we can see that it's an error because it's red. Um, but there's a huge problem with this. Um, and it's probably like I'm not blaming developers to do this, but it's more like a design error or issue. I don't, I don't like the word error, even though I wrote it. <laughs> but um, anyway, a lot of people have color, um, I call it blindness, uh, like one in every 12 men and one in every 200 women. So statistically speaking, some of you will be colorblind in this room. Um, you don't need to raise your hand, it's fine. Uh, if you don't know if you're colorblind, public uh, service for you. If you cannot uh, see numbers in these, in these dots, in these circles, it's maybe because you're colorblind or because the screen projector is shit. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, just Google color blindness test and you'll see it on your screens. 
So an easy fix in terms of design is just like just put an icon there. Like if there is an icon, uh, then you don't rely on color alone. So you could see this even if it was black and white, you would recognize that as being the error. Good. So let's start like to try to type this, and you could start. Okay, let's. There's an email text. There's an input, and then there's uh, another uh, paragraph for the error with an SVG in there. Let's slowly start to make this more accessible. Uh, first of all, again, I can no content. Is that there's no content on the icon that we want to be out loud. Uh, so are you hidden true here? Then. Um, let's just associate the label with the input, because if the user is on the input, it needs to know what is this field about. Uh, so one way to do that is to, to transform the, the paragraph into a label, but it's not enough. Uh, we also need to say this label is a label for, and what you put inside is the ID of the element that this label is being labeled. Does it make sense somehow? Like the, the email inside the for is the ID of the element of the input. It's pretty weird, but I guess you understand. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so another way, like just, just like we associated the label with the input, we can also associate the error with the input. Uh, one way to do that is to use aria uh, described by, which a lot of people get confused by uh, labels. So the a description is not a label. A description is like uh, extra information, while the label is like, what is, what is this? And the description is like, more information about this. So the, the error fits this, so it's, an error is like more information on this field. Um, and it's the same as the for. So we put there, uh, what we write inside the idea described by is an ID of the element that is describing this field. So the, the ID is being passed there in the paragraph. Um, another thing we can do is add uh, idea live. Uh, so one thing is like screen readers, they only, only announce the things that you are currently looking at. So if you're typing, the screen reader, like just because something was added below in the DOM, they, it, it won't announce anything because you're not there, like you're not looking at it. Uh, so one thing you can do is add Aria Live, uh, and there's two possible values, uh, polite and assertive. Uh, so po polite, um, so here's the difference. Polite just uh, is a little bit less intrusive. It waits for the user to stop writing before it tells you, oh, this email is not valid. And the assertive uh, one uh, is just like, Every time you type, like, it will just constantly try to, to read that to you, which could be anno annoying for an email field, for example, because the email is only valid at the end. Um, so yeah. Good. So example six, tip number six, and it's notifications. And what I mean by notifications are things like this. Uh, even though here you don't see, but it's, imagine that this is like a box. Um, so you just did something. Uh, maybe you submitted a form, and out of this, you either get an error or a success, but you want to let screen reader users know this, uh, that something happened. Uh, maybe you received an email, like maybe it was not even triggered by user action, it was just like, you received an email. Um, and you, you, you need to, to let screen readers know this. So let's start again, um, just a div, SVG, uh, two text elements there. Um, same thing as we did so far. Are you hidden true on the icon? There, I mean, it's just presentation. Um, and then there's a new thing called role status. So when something is role status, um, it's for some, it should add it for something that is like time sensitive, like this. Um, so for, it's exactly for this type of patterns. Uh, what this does, in fact, is that every element that has role status has already Adi life polite by default. So you don't, you don't need to add Adi life. It's like role status already. It's already Aria Life polite. Yeah, but just here for completeness. Good. So remember when I told you, uh, tell you about tooling and automated tests? Um, so there's a tip here about that. So let's see what we can use uh, in terms of tools. Um, so th maybe the easiest one is linting. Um, so I don't know, you probably use linting. It's auto I don't want to, to tell you what is linting if you don't use it, but if you do, um, so there's some ESLint uh, plugin only for React, that's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. For J not for React, for JSX. Um, so you can just install it through NPM, add it to your config. And then if you have your editor uh, correctly configured, uh, as when you're writing code, for example, here we are using an image, and uh, remember the example from earlier, there's no alt attribute. Um, 
So in your editor, you will immediately see image elements must have an alt prop, either with meaningful text or an empty string for decorative images. So there's exactly a rule for that, uh, which is very useful because, I mean, no one remembers everything at every time. Uh, so it's just nice to have these hints as we type. Good. So there's also, uh, if you're not using linter or because you want to use other things, there's this axe score uh, thing. So axe score, uh, I mean, if you have Chrome, there's this audit uh, tab on the DevTools. And in this audit, you can run an accessibility audit. Uh, so this is powered by axe score. Uh, it's not the latest version. But anyway, axe score powers that. And you can use uh, axe score. Uh, in your development workflow. I mean, you can always also go to like to the tab and eat like audit and wait, and then you will see the results. Uh, but I just find this a, a slightly better way to use it. Uh, so you just, if you're in development mode, uh, so the first part of the if, uh, you import React Axe, and th this is using the dynamic imports. So it just to make sure that this never gets bundled. Um, so whenever we uh, import this, then we just wrap React and React DOM uh, with Axe, and this um, does some magic behind, uh, but it analyzes your, like, your React tree, um, your virtual DOM, which is cool. Uh, and you will see these on your console, like accessibility errors will be shown in the console. Uh, and I, I find it a little bit better than the, the tab, because the tab is like you need to go there and then click, and then errors will show, but all, you need still to remember this. And I just find this is like it's more in your face, like the errors will show as your yeah, it gets in your way, and then people fix it more often. Good. Um, another thing is you can use it with Jest. Um, so in your CI, maybe you have tests already. Um, there's also a plugin for Jest uh, that runs Axe Core. Um, yeah, you can install it, and you can use it like this. I, yeah, I, it's pretty straightforward if you use Jest. Uh, so if you don't, it's, this will be totally complex, but I don't want to explain this now. Uh, baby steps. Good. Um, only two left. Um, let's talk about client-side routing. Uh, so ride, ride, uh, routing in client-side apps is, ri routing in general is just something that lets you create pages and navigate with those pages with links. Uh, so if you're doing a single page app, usually you have a router with it. So in most routers, um, they have this problem, like when the user clicks, uh, even though th some content on the page gets replaced by something else, the screen reader doesn't know that. Uh, so it, imagine if you're a screen reader user using uh, an experience like this, you just have a link, you click there, and then silence. You don't, you don't hear anything, so you're stuck. Uh, good, so there's, I mean, there's no consensus on what's the best way here. I mean, I'll just share a couple of options. Um, so the first option is to focus, let's say you have a, a component that is like the new page, and maybe you have like a, an outer wrapper div or what, whatnot. So one approach would be to focus on that div. Uh, but divs are not uh, focusable by default, uh, unlike buttons or links or other focusable things. Uh, so one, to make it focusable, you first need to add tab index of minus one. This makes the div uh, focusable. And then, of course, because when the screen reader goes to this div, we need to add a label um, to it. Uh, and we can use maybe an H1 element that will be injected on the page. It's probably the most common thing. A uh, small thing here to point out. Before I, tell, I told you about add a label, this is add a labeled by, slightly different. While the other, you could just write inside of it uh, the text. This one, you point, it's an ID to the element that it's the labeling. So if the element is already on the page, probably you, you just need to reuse it. Um, which is good. You don't need to duplicate it. Um, yeah, so in, you do that, and then this is quite React-specific, uh, but the way to focus things on React uh, when they are mounted is to pass a ref, and uh, with hooks, you can create a, a, an effect. Uh, yeah, I don't want to get much more into it, but anyway, this is the same as component did mount, so when the component gets into the page, the element will be focused. And the screen reader will tell you because there was a change in the active element. Good. So option B, and um, some people think that, argue that this is better, um, but again, no real consensus. It's the same idea, but instead of focusing on the div, uh, is to focus on the H1 instead. Um, so I'm just keeping this because it's exactly the same. 
except you don't have ARIA labeled by, so maybe it's a little bit simpler to use. Good. Um, if you want to know about this debate, there's, I mean, the Gatsby team is, is doing uh, very cool stuff um, with this, uh, with their router, which is Rich UI, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they actually test with, the, with real users, and they, like, they are doing this research of seeing what works, what not. Uh, it's a really good uh, article. Um, so, but anyway, they recommend this second way, uh, but it's not only that, they do a lot more stuff. I have an example of like the super good example that they tested, or the example that performed the, the best. Uh, they did a screencast and of this last week. For the site visit we've got here, I would list banner, landmark header, link back, and prototype list. I would header main landmark navigation, landmark main navigation list of four items, bullet link, current page home. So I'm currently on the home page, I can count. Bullet link about. Bullet link portfolio. Bullet link contact. I would list heading level two home link, skip to main navigation. So this is the home, and I've seen the results, so I'm going to go pick one. Banner land. List with one item. Address insert. Back. Main land. About link. I will pick about. And so now I don't have to focus on that link, and I'll go ahead and press enter here. New page column. About. Skip to main navigation link heading level two. So it's told me that I've loaded a new page called out, and I've been placed on the skip to main navigation header or a link, which if I press that, would take me right back to the menu. Or I can go ahead and arrow down and read the content. No small heavy angry word for very taste while plug your app without going to see. Which is just great fellow content that sounds extremely new when you read the screen readers. Yeah. Good. So uh, anyway, just uh, the, the blog post uh, explains it much better than I could ever do. Uh, so now this is like the hardest, the, the last one and the hardest one, uh, but we are getting to the end. So I'm trying to rush it. So an accordion. Um, does, uh, if you don't know an accordion, it's one of these elements you often see on the website that you, they try to squeeze the content into like sections that can expand and collapse. Uh, I think the reason for that is just trying to not overwhelm the user with a lot of information. Uh, so for example, assuming we have something like this, we could click on the delivery and it would open and then show more content of delivery. This is totally a made up example. So one way we can do that, and let's just focus on like one uh, individual uh, bit. So we have like two divs, one for the payment uh, thing that we see and the other one that is currently hidden, but it's there for the content. Um, so what, what can we do? Uh, but first of all, we can start adding meaning to these things, and by meaning it's uh, using the right HTML5 tar tags or landmarks, and let's assume in this example, uh, the H3, it's, it's what it should be in the context of this made up example, uh, but be below we have a section. Uh, one thing I, to notice here, in H3, while good, because hierarchically it's the payments, we still need to make it uh, interactable to both mouse users and keyboard <laughs> users um, uh, with a button, for example. It's probably the most straightforward way. Um, good, so in this button, we also have inside some SVG, which again, we do at a hidden true, because if it's a plus or minus, like doesn't really say anything for a screen reader user. And one thing we can do is uh, every section uh, needs to be labeled. Uh, so we can use this button to become the, the label, labeling element of the, the section. Uh, we've seen that before, it's with ADIA labeled by, with an ID, and the ID being of the thing we want to be uh, labeled. Good, uh, we can also try to do this uh, the, the other way around. Like if, you're, if you're in a button, we can say this button, controls the section, right? It controls something. So there's these area controls whenever we want to, to have a button controlling a part of the page below. Like in accordion, right? Like this button controls something that will appear. And so in this case, uh, it says readers uh, and closed hide content from screen reader users. Um, so for example, when, when this accordion item is closed, uh, we can add this uh, another area attribute called area expanded that gets, it, it has two possible values. Uh, true or false, and in, in this case, like the one that is shown on top, top is, is closed. Uh, it's not expanded, the accordion. And the other thing we need to do is, on the section, we can just hide it altogether. It's like it's, it's, like it's not even there. Uh, because otherwise, screen readers, even though it's not shown, screen readers might just uh, be able to reach it. There's other ways to hide it, uh, like display none would be fine. 
Uh, good. So whenever we want to open, we just change this aria expanded to true, and we remove the, the aria, the hidden thing. Good. And we just do these like n times. Like the, the according, the way to simplify it is just to think about one and then just having more. Um, but there's more complex things, like maybe if you open one, the other closes, that's fine. Just update things accordingly. Um, but I would say this is the easiest way to do an accordion. Good, so uh, we are out of examples, and I just want to wrap up a little bit. Um, so what can we, where can we go from here? So I think all of you, what, what I encourage is that you try to become the, like an accessibility advocate within your company. Uh, I mean, maybe there's a lot of your coworkers that are not even aware of these. It's not only developers, also designers, uh, product managers, um, clients. Uh, I mean, you really need to advocate for accessibility, make them understand like why is this a problem, and really encourage this because otherwise they will just say, yeah, but like it works on my machine. <laughs> uh, you know, you know the drill. <laughs> yeah, it works on my machine. Uh, good. So uh, the other thing is like, don't look at this as being like, oh, I made like an in inaccessible website. I think like there's, it's not like white and black and white here. Um, so it's more like ju just do small stuff, like quick wins will help. Um, maybe take these tips and start from the, the ones I said in the beginning. They are maybe easier and just slowly start to like make a website more accessible. Uh, one good way, for example, to detect this is like force yourself for one day to not touch your mouse. Like try to use your website with the keyboard. And I guarantee you that you will find a lot of issues. Good. So I share tips like this on Twitter uh, if you're interested in these sort of things. Um, so if you want to know more about this, just uh, let's keep talking on Twitter. It's probably the best. And that's a wrap. Thank you.